Thank you very much for taking the time today to view our video. Before we begin, we'd like to take a moment to introduce ourselves. There are many aspects to 9.connect, but it boils down to the fact that we're a PCB-centric organization. We believe and focus on the PCB due to the fact that it is truly the center point of all electronic design. That's where our expertise lies. We provide services not only in the PCB layout, but in design consulting as well. And during the technical portion of this webinar, you will see this expertise in motion. We are now the exclusive North American instructors for Altium Designer. We host 100 trainings throughout the year across North America, and we are excited to bring these trainings closer to you. In addition to our services, we are also a value-added reseller for a number of PCB-related software companies. And just to note, each company has been presented in past webinars. So if you're interested in them, please contact us or check out our website. And by the way, we provide one-on-one -on -one coaching for these tools as well. For more information on our services and past webinars, please contact us. Our information is listed in the description below. Thank you for giving us a moment of your time, and please enjoy the presentation. Libraries built to last. Why do we call it this? Because one of the problems that we're seeing in the industry is that people are building libraries not necessarily to last, but just to get through the project. Okay? And if you look at this process over here, we just kind of look at the processes. Yeah, we get a symbol library for the schematic capture. Yeah, we get a footprint library for the PCB layout. And they're really only there just for those what we'll call domains. So believe it or not, we're dealing with different domains. And I'll talk a little bit more about this here in a couple of minutes, what we mean by domains. But the idea behind this over here is that, well, I need a symbol for my schematic capture. OK, I'm done with my schematic capture. Fine, I need something for my library. I'm done with that. I push this over to purchasing. Purchasing pushes this over to uh, manufacturing assembly. End of story, right? Well, if you've been through this, you know that this is um, this is a very rudimentary way of looking at things, and that the libraries actually have to provide a little more information. So let's take a look at this over here. What are the libraries capable of providing us? What's the necessity behind them? Okay. So when we're working in schematic capture, it's more than just creating a symbol. Okay. It's also about creating a bomb, and I'll talk about this here in just a moment. Okay. As a matter of fact, as a little side note. What I find interesting about Altium Designer, I don't know about the other EDA tools. I think one of them will allow this. But in Altium Designer, have you ever noticed that they don't allow a pin primitive in the schematic editor? Well, the reason they don't allow it is because they knew that designers would immediately build the parts within the, uh, within the editor itself, and they would never bother with a library. So why is Altium trying to push you over to a library? Well, what they're trying to do is they're trying to get you uh, in such a, get it set, set up in such a way that you have everything in one container. And I'll talk about this here in just a couple of moments. But if we think of it this way, what are the libraries providing for us? One of the things they're providing for us is um, they're ultimately providing us pin information, which in turn gets connected in the schematic capture, which in turn gets pushed over as a netlist to the PCB layout. Now, in Altium, we're spoiled. Why are we spoiled? Because we just press a button, actually two buttons. We click the ECO button. We execute it, and boom, the netlist gets pushed from the schematic capture of the PCB layout. We don't have to do any imports or exports of it. So it's almost pretty much, it's not only seamless, it's almost invisible to us. We never even look at the netlist as it's going through. And yeah, you know what? We do push the footprints over. And so this is a good exercise in having a symbol library for the purposes of linking a footprint to it and getting it over to the PCB layout. Fine and dandy. What are we doing in the PCB layout? We're trying to get ourselves to manufacturing files. What are the manufacturing files? Well, they could be Gerber, ODB++. They could also be the IPC uh, 2581. Uh, as a side note for your Altium users, uh, 8015 will have that capability available as another option uh, when they release it here. So that's fine and dandy. But what always seems to get neglected, number one, is the pick and place file. Well, the pick and place file is actually heavily reliant on the footprint library. So if there's additional time and effort put into the footprint library, your pick and place file is going to be improved dramatically. Okay? But now I want to talk about the bill of materials for a moment. And let's think about this. Because the bill of materials is not pointing over here. And you may find that kind of interesting. Why is it not pointing over here? There's a reason for it. As a matter of fact, it should be pointing where it is right here. And you want to deal with the bill of materials at the end of the schematic design. And I've mentioned this in the past, but I think it's really worth repeating. What tends to happen in the PCB process, the methodology of going from uh, concept to design, 
you build something in the schematic capture. All eyes are on the schematic capture. Why are they all on the schematic capture? Well, that's where program management tends to look at things. Where how are you progressing with the schematic? The library is kind of secondary, right? It's support to that schematic capture. All right, we've got the schematic capture done. Show us something else that you're doing. All right, let me get into the PCB. The PCB is very visual as well, so they can see what's going on the PCB side. Great, we've got the PCB done. Push it to manufacturing. Now I get to my bill of materials. And then that's where it really becomes really problematic because now, number one, you're probably writing it up by hand, and that's a, that's a huge inefficiency. Plus, there's a lot of uh, error. It can be very error prone. But more importantly, you're banking on the fact that every one of the components that you picked, you pick the right footprints for them. You pick things that are in stock. You pick things that have appropriate lead times to them. And if any one of those things uh, gets uh, kind of thrown out of kilter over here, you may be scrapping boards and going for another respin. And that respin can easily be two to three weeks to fix the schematic, which in turn has to fix the PCB, which in turn may have to do a lot of rerouting in there in order to get that out to uh, a new set of manufacturing files. So that's why the bill of materials is over here. And then the question may say, like, well, great, why do, how do bombs and symbol libraries come together? Well, the bill of materials over here can effectively emanate from the symbol library. And we'll see that here as we go about. So let me kind of bring this up over here. I mentioned this a little bit earlier on. But let's take a moment to push the process out of, here, out of sight for a moment. Let's talk about the component itself. What is the component? Well, is it a symbol? Is it a footprint? Is it the sim model? If you have a simulation for SPICE or IBIS, are they the parameters? Well, the answer to that is it's all of the above. In electrical engineering, especially in PCB design, we deal with multiple domains. It's kind of weird to think of it that way. But we deal with the schematic editor, but that's really a dimensionless domain to represent circuitry. What about the footprints? Well, the footprints aren't actually the component themselves. It's really what they're going to land on in the PCB. Okay? And we're talking now about the layout domain and the PCB domain. If you're dealing with simulation models, you're dealing with the verification domain. If you're dealing with parameters, you're dealing with the manufacturing domain. You see how many different domains we're dealing with over here? So as a result of that, we need a container for all of these things. That's why a library comes into play. So. How, do we, how does this container get created? Where do we seem to go with these containers every single time we, we start a design? Well, by the nature of EDA, since, the, since they began back in the early 1980s and up to this point in time, a lot of us have focused on what I'll call a symbol-centric library. And a symbol-centric library makes a lot of sense because of all the domains that we deal with that we just showed in the prior slide, which one do we start with at the very beginning? It's the symbol. So we may as well glom everything around the symbol because as we move to these different domains, it's all based on what we did with the symbol. Okay? So when we look at the, uh, if we look at a symbol-centric library, this one is specific to Altium, but I'm pretty sure that any other EDA tool has a similar concept. That when we uh, open up the library editor and we decide we're going to create a new symbol, we create an actual graphic for it, which we see over here. We also attach a footprint to it, even though it's coming from another library, we say, well, at some point we're going to need this footprint, so we attach a footprint to it. Well, if we're doing any type of simulation, whether it is a simulation or it's in signal integrity, we've got to attach that to it as well. And then finally, and the most important part as far as I'm concerned, is you've got to put the parameters. Some people call them attributes. I like calling it intelligent data. Why is this intelligent data over here? Because if all this stuff is put together in a library, by the mere fact that I put down a part onto my design, and not just putting down a symbol, but I put down my symbol with intelligent data in it, it instantly creates the bill of materials for us. And so if you are finding yourself building a bill of materials time and time again through an Excel sheet, then you want to think long and hard about, can I put this information up front so it's being stored? And every time I reuse this part, that information is just instantly propagating over to the design, which in turn instantly gives me a bill of materials. And that alone, to me, is the most important aspect of any of these design things. I mean, you certainly need footprints. And if you're doing simulation, you certainly need that aspect of it alone, those things too. All these domains are important. But this over here gets you to the bill of materials, which has really caused a lot of grief and aggravation if it's ignored until the very end. Okay. So those are the things that we're using a symbol-centric library for. Now, Symbol-centric libraries, they happen by their nature. I'll talk a little bit more about how they kind of propagate and come about here in just a moment. But there are some snags to uh, 
to the symbol centric libraries. I want to give you an example, at least on a component level here. So imagine you've got four 10K ohm resistors. And you've got them of different powers, which therefore require different footprint sizes. So how do you represent these structures? Well, there's option A. And option A is that, well, I've got a resistor. And I'm going to put all the footprints that I can find that are associated with resistors with this uh, symbol. Okay? So what are the pros of this? It's, uh, it just basically doesn't require you to constantly copy this. Every time you create something in a symbol-centric library, you're effectively copying the graphic again and again and again. If you have 100 resistors, you're copying that 100 times over. Okay? And so just by using this alone, it's like, well, every time I need a resistor, I throw it out there. Okay? Go this way. All right? And it's easier to find footprints for it, too, because they're all located in one location. All right? But where are the cons to this? So the problem is you can't put unique information on this. You can't call this a Panasonic resistor or a Sunumu uh, resistor or a Vishay resistor. It's got to be just a generic resistor. And then later on, within the design itself, you've got to start giving it specific parameters as to what specific resistor am I referring to. Right? Some people like to design that way. It's like, well, I'll throw the resistor down first. I know I need a 10K over here. I'll run spice simulation models on it. And then later on, I'll deal with the manufacturer that will fit that. And you can do it that way. But you can put all of these things in uh, simultaneously. So. Um, it, it, you have, sorry, I was just a little distracted there. Let me go back to that. You can put these things in here, but at some point you're going to have to go through each and every single one of these here, and you're going to have to um, basically provide them a unique, unique, pardon me, a unique name and a unique number. But more importantly, if you don't do this during the design time here, you're going to have to, again, do a manual creation of the bill of materials. So I'm not a keen fan of this concept over here um, in using option A. Option B I like a lot more because the idea is that every single time I create a resistor, there's going to be a real manufacturer name and a real manufacturer's part number uh, behind this. Okay? And so that's definitely the pros behind it. By having these unique parameters here, well, great. If, I had, if this is a Panasonic part and it's a certain a number and I've already got my simulation, uh, let's say my spice model to it, I can place it down. I can do my spice. And then later on, I can actually purchase the part through a bill of materials. Okay? So bomb, you basically bomb creation by placement. But what are the cons to this? Same symbol gets duplicated across all the components. Every time I have to add in a new resistor, I basically have got to copy the graphic of the last one. And it's not hard to do. It's just it takes a while, right? Uh, it, it's, it's a lot of mouse clicking. It's also a lot of attention to detail. And if you're trying to rush through it, there's an opportunity of skipping something over. So even the slightest parameter variation, especially in the manufacturing name, or pardon me, the manufacturer's part number, so if the manufacturer's part number is actually geared to talk about different packages, you've got to create one for each different package type. Okay? And the big thing about these symbol-centric libraries in general is that you can't, uh, it, when they say access, you really can't be writing into them simultaneously. Everybody, if, some, if someone has a hold of it, then the file's going to get locked out for the other person. Okay? All right. More important, so we just talked about kind of the component aspects of a symbol-centric library. Those are work. Those can be worked around. They're not big issues. They're just inconvenient issues. Are there easier ways to handle it? Yeah, I'll talk about that in a couple of minutes. But what really worries me about symbol-centric libraries is the manage of, management of those in a team environment. What's a team environment? As far as I'm concerned, two or more people. Okay. So this is what I have seen happen time and time again when I've talked to customers, or in some cases been called in to um, actually do consultation, there's a couple of companies that have done that. What happens is option A, and I think this happens about 95% of the time. I'll call it the Wild West. So let me th put you through the scenario. I think most of you have probably been through this scenario. You get a brand new EDA tool, and either through assignment or desire, you're going to build the first design in that EDA tool. So there's no infrastructure of the company. You just have this EDA tool. So you start a design, and yeah, these EDA companies do provide libraries. You just got to remember that no library is, com is complete or comprehensive. Just as a side note, there's, I believe, over 650 million components out there, according to a silicon expert. Now, granted, a lot of those parts, you'll never see the light of day because these are massive chip, chip sets that are sold to, let's say, Samsung or to LG. Uh, or to Apple, they're sold in the millions, and they're only sold to those particular manufacturers and um, IP producers. So a good portion of those never see the light of day because they're just not made publicly uh, available. So let's say there's even like 5 million components. 
That's still a lot of components, and no one, no EDA tool currently provides all those. So at some point down the road, you're going to have to build your own part. There's a good chance you'll have to build your own part. In fact, almost in every single design, you'll have to build your own part. It's really hard to build a new design without adding something new to it. All right, so you build a new, uh, build a, you have to build a new part here. So what do you do? The first thing you do is you open up a library, symbol library editor, because I need, I need to get a symbol going. And you draw up the symbol, and you save it, and then you place on the design. Congratulations, you just built the library. Okay? That happens pretty much every single time. So now user A, we'll call it user A, continues to build their design, continues to put things into this library. Well, pretty soon they've got a pretty decent library for themselves. Now let's say user B comes along, and again, either through desire or mandate, they've got to use the new EDA tool as well. So maybe initially user A and user B say, well, let's share the library together, and they quickly realize that no two of them can work on it simultaneously. And user B looks at the way user A did it, and user B came from another company and says, well, that's OK, but I prefer to use this method that we used at this other company. So pretty soon user A and user B are doing their own thing. User C comes along. User C eventually will create their own library. User D comes along. User D starts creating their own library. Pretty soon everybody has their own library. Okay? So let's talk about the pros. There's actually a pro about this. This means that the designers are getting their job done. Why is that? Because they're moving along at their own speed and pace. Okay? So they're designing these things as they're, uh, as they're moving about. They're not waiting for anybody. But the cons really start outweighing the pros. Number one, there's just absolutely no standardization across any of these libraries. More importantly, there's a duplicate effort. I always find it amazing. Uh, everybody has to, it's, it's almost like a rite of passage that everybody creates their own resistor. Uh, it's just kind of it always humored me about that. But, Everybody sees the resistors in different ways, in different forms, and so they'll all uh, basically duplicate the effort by drawing their own resistor. Okay? Unfortunately, it's completely unsearchable because it's all on everybody's local drive, so I have no idea what user D is doing or user C is doing unless I'm actually having a conversation with them about it. Difficult to move, between, uh, move designs between team members. If we're all using different libraries, now granted, with Altium, you have static libraries, so whatever you put into your design will stay in the design. But if I want to uh, use another part from the library, you know, I've got to really let that library tag along with it because it's, that design is in the style of that library. Okay. No central uh, source of truth because everybody's got their own methodologies of doing it. And there's also lost data when personnel leave. So you know, if someone leaves and their machine gets wiped out, well, maybe you're able to salvage the PCB designs off of it. But uh, a lot of people forget about the library aspect of it. So that library is actually uh, gone. Yes, you can pull them out of the designs in Altium, but it, it's you know that's time consuming, right? And do you really want to salvage those things? So, and again, it, almost impossible to merge. As far as I'm concerned, they are impossible to merge together. If everybody has taken all their libraries and they have tried to push them all together, even if you do a copy and paste in them, it, the, this, the graphics alone will become a, a big issue. So maybe user A uses B size sheets and drew the resistors to handle B size sheets. Maybe there's user user B wanted D size sheets and actually draws the resistors twice the size so they can see them in the D size sheet. And then user C came from Europe and so they've used in the European style of resistor. So everybody's got to get together and figure out which resistor they want to use. Okay, now I'm giving very simple examples. If you imagine hundreds of these parts, well, a lot of them with their ICs and people doing ICs in different ways as to where they're putting the power and how they're sorting out the pins. This can become a, a huge undertaking. And that's not to mention all the data that's in there. Let's talk about wattages, for example. Someone may have a column called watt. Another one may call it wattage. Another person may call it power. And even if they all had the same column, the way they format it would be different. One person might say 1 fourth watt. One other person may say 0.25. Another person may just say 1 fourth. So not only are the columns going to get all screwed up, the, the formats of the values are going to get screwed up. So that's why I'm just forewarning you now that this method of taking individual libraries and trying to mishmash them together is really almost impossible. I, I, as I said, I just, the almost there gives you a gleam of hope. As far as I'm concerned, it's impossible. Okay. All right. Let's go to the opposite end of this. Let's talk about the situation where everybody gets together and says, look, we bought this new EDA tool. We learned from our mistakes in the past. From now on, we're going to have a dedicated librarian. So we're going to go to the opposite stream where only the librarian can add things into the tool, okay? or pardon me, into the library. All right, so what are the pros of this? Well, first and foremost, the standardization, you'll be assured. Everything's going to look the same. 
right, when you pull it out. It's, it's, it's kind of a nice thing to look at it and, it and to know that someone has not only made everything have the same look and feel to it, but more importantly, it's a single source of truth. You know when you pull from there, someone has reviewed that part. Okay? But even the cons start outweighing the pros here, too. And this one, to me, is really important, that the component turnaround time can be very, very lengthy. Now, in my own history, I used to work at a defense company, and we used board station. And at that company, they could lock out the libraries. Okay? And in my situation, because it was taking so long for them to actually build the parts for my PCB board, I had to outsource it in order for me to make deadlines. Okay, so I went from really a design engineer to a document, uh, a systems engineer just to do documentation specification so I could have someone else do my boards and get them back in the nick of time. Okay? Now, in Altium, we can't lock out the libraries. So guess what happened? The minute this becomes way too difficult, what's the designer going to do? The designer's not going to twiddle their thumbs and talk to their pr program manager and say, well, I'm just waiting for the librarian. Baloney. They're still going to be held to the same deadline, so they're going to go off and build their own parts. And that's where all the problems are going to begin with this. Okay? If the system's too difficult, the designer's going to bypass it. I've got to get my job done. Nice try, guys. Talk to me later when you got your when you got your act together. Number two, librarians can't write into the library files while they're in use. So a lot of times they'll have a master and they'll push out a copy of it for everybody to use and to link up to. Well, again, if the designer's having a hard time getting their parts from the librarian, what are they going to do? They're going to take a copy of the master library, they're going to put it on their local drive, and they're going to start adding parts to the, the local copy. And then they don't want to take the new master out because they don't want to stop on the work that they've already done. Or they start having four or five different flavors of this library sitting there because every time a new library comes in, they give it a slightly different name, and now they're actually pointing to five, six, seven, so on number of libraries. And as, as the librarian's making changes, maybe some of those things are wrong, and they've made changes to the newer versions of it. Well, the, the designer doesn't see that because they're just playing with from whatever library is available to them at that moment in time and, uh, in their own directory. And then lastly, there's still a challenge to scale this thing, meaning that if someone comes to the librarian and says, dude, Take this, here's the whole Panasonic ERJ series I've got the, in front of me over here. There's like 50 different flavors of uh, components here. Actually, it's probably even more just given the number of different footprints and so on and so forth to it. But the, uh, you know, take this and just give me the values for these 50 footprints. You got it. The, the librarian's going to go in there. They're going to have to make a copy of it. They're going to make some changes to it. They're going to copy it again, make some changes to it. And there's no scalability to it. So you don't get any what well, I'll call benefit by volume. They're going to, it's going to take them the same time to do it, whether it's one part or it's going to take them to do 50 parts. Okay? So the short of it that I want to bring up over here is that the fundamental limitation of symbols and in integrated libraries is the following, is that, number one, they are just not scalable. Okay? And that's just a big issue. You just, it's not easy to scale, as I just mentioned earlier on. Okay? You can't reuse the same component across multiple components. Yes, you can copy it. But wouldn't it be nice to just to point to it once as a reference or a pointer and just say, hey, every time I do this, point to this resistor and use it, rather than having to copy and paste it. If I got 100 resistors, I got to copy it 100 times. Okay? No two people can access that library simultaneously. You can't. Someone's going to lock it out the minute they open it up. All right? And then it's very difficult. I keep going back to this. To me, it's impossible to gracefully just merge those libraries, period. One side note for everybody out there, I know that we have some individuals uh, joining us today who are not necessarily Altium users. The integrated library is still considered to be a symbol-centric library. Uh, in Altium, you can take a symbol library and a PCB library, and you can compile them together as a single binary called an integrated library. But the fact of the matter is it's still a, it's still a symbol-centric library. So that's why we kind of group these all together here. So then the question is, are there some, is there a better way to do this? so that we can have a, an easier team environment? And the answer is yes. And we've got to look at the concept of a database library. Now, I know that people who've worked in database libraries in the past, they have a good feel for this. For those people who are new to it, um, let me kind of explain a couple of things over here. Because what I have found when I talk to a lot of customers, there is a need to kind of twist our minds around to understand that the symbol is no longer the center of attention. Because all of us are so used to everything being so symbol-centric, we have to get around the idea that just a row or record, so in, in Excel it's a row, and in a database library it's a record, but basically a row of information is the component. And that the symbol is demoted to nothing more than a graphical representation. 
just like the footprint. If you think about it from a symbol-centric point of view, what about the footprint? Well, the footprint is just nothing more than a bunch of arcs and traces and paths. Right? There's no knowledge or there's no real um, intellectual information that's being passed along. It's just being linked on to the symbol. Well, think of the symbol being the exact same way in reference to database library. And that's what you're seeing over here. And when I talk about this over here, there's some kind of interesting points I want to make. What you're seeing over here, these five things, item, symbol, symbol, path, footprint, and footprint path, those are the minimal things you need to put together for a database. And it will work. That's all you need to do. The item is just a unique ID. Databases need to have unique IDs. There always has to be one column that has unique information in it. It could be a company part number. Uh, my recommendation is it's a company part number. Don't, I don't recommend, let's say, manufacturer's part numbers or supplier's part numbers because there's always an opportunity for them not to be unique. And if you're controlling it through uh, your company part number, then that guarantees that they'll always be unique. An Altium designer, if you have two, um, assuming that you can get through your, your database tool without it balking at you for having two items of the same number in it, Altium will ignore the second one every single time. It won't even acknowledge it's there. So, but all you need is to have a unique ID, your symbol and your symbol path, right, to say, well, hey, where, where's the library located? What's the symbol name? Same thing for the footprint. Where's the footprint uh, library? What's the name? That's all you need. Isn't that cool? That's all you need. But what about these parameters? What's the deal with the parameters? Do you ever notice, especially in Alpine Designer, footprints have no parameters? Why do they do that? They did that on purpose, by the way. They do that on purpose because, as far as they're concerned, that information for the parameters is needed up front in the schematic for two purposes. The first purpose is to inform the designer, educate the designer as to what the part is all about. So when they look in the library, the more parameters you have, the more information you're providing about the part, and in turn, the designer can make an intelligent choice as to the component that they're going to use. Now, they place down the part. If that part has this intelligent data, these parameters in there, your bill of materials gets created. Okay? That's the whole purpose and point behind having parameters. Bill of materials and, and intelligent decisions and design. Okay? Now, one of the things I'm going to show you over here very briefly is the difference between a schematic symbol from a schematic-centric design uh, library and the other one is going to be what we do when we're trying to basically turn the symbol into something for the database, just a graphic. So for the uh, schematic component includes all the parameters and all the links. You see all the parameters over here. You see all the links over here. So that's the traditional symbol-centric design, or pardon me, library. As opposed to, look, notice here for the dblib component, the, there is, it's just a generic name. It's just called resistor. Okay? And more importantly, there's just no parameters. Why? Because the parameters are in the database. There's no links to any models. Why? Because all that stuff's in the database. All right? So that's what we're... Um, that's the big difference over here. The other aspect of it, too, is that in a schematic library, a symbol-centric library, this is going to be represented, let's say you've got 1,000 resistors. This is represented 1,000 times for each one of those resistors. In the database library, you have only one resistor. And all of the information in the database library, and I'll point to that here right now, notice that no matter how many of these things I have, if it's a resistor, and assuming it's using my gen generic resistor, uh, symbol, they're just going to keep pointing to the same one. Okay? And that they basically says to Altium, if I select this over here, hey, go over to this library, use this symbol, and put it down. And that's all I'm doing. Same thing with the footprints. So what are the benefits of this? We can reuse models across different components, both in terms of symbols and footprints. The parameters can be uniquely set for each component. That's what makes them components, right? The unique information for each one. The libraries, more importantly, can be edited outside of the design tool because the database is not in Alpine Designer. These databases are external, for example, or any other EDA tool for that matter. I'm talking about things like Excel, if you want to use Excel. Uh, you've got Microsoft Access. You've got SQL, MySQL, the larger PLM systems like Arena and Agile and iServer and so on and so forth. They're all sitting outside of Altium or your EDA tool. And they all have linker, they have linker files, like Alpium has, um, has dblib, which is just a link file to get you over to your database. Okay? So you work outside of it, which now means you're not tying up um, a license of Alpium or tying up the file in order to get this stuff in. And it's actually very compatible with existing uh, library methodologies. If you're in a symbol-centric library and you want to move to a 
database library, it's possible. And if you want to move your database library to a version database library where you want some version control, it's very possible as well. And later on, if you actually want to move it to a vault, you could actually do that as well. Or if you want to move it to an integrated PLM system, you can do that as well. Or shoot, if you want to take your database library and push it back to a symbol-centric library, you can do that now, team, as well. So this whole concept of a database library allows you to uh, a lot of flexibility to move forward as your company grows. All right, this is what it looks like in general. For almost any EDA tool, this is a little bit more specific to Alpine, but the idea behind this is as follows. Uh, you'd be looking through your schematic browser. In Altium, they have a libraries panel. From the libraries panel, you use something called a dblib link file, or pardon me, dblib file. There's actually a difference. The dblib file basically contains information as to where to look for the database. It goes through something called an ODBC connector. What's an ODBC connector? You've probably heard of it a thousand times, have no idea what it is. Look at it as nothing more than a driver. Okay? It's a driver for databases. And all databases adhere to the ODBC standard uh, because they want programs to be able to link with it. If you can't link to a server, then no one's going to buy your, or pardon me, not to a server, but to a database, no one's going to use your database. Okay? So, and then the database itself, well, what is that? It's really just nothing more than uh, really a table of rows and columns of, uh, of information, textual information. And from there, they point out to directory information where the symbol graphics are stored, the footprint graphics are stored, the simulation uh, text files are stored, signal integrity files are stored. Okay? So that's what you're doing here. So when you call up something in Altium, say, hey, I, want to, um, I need to get something out of the database, it uses this link file, which in turn talks to the ODBC connector and, it, and goes into the database to look around. And then from there, gets all the textual information, returns it back to Alpine, and says, aha, I know where the symbol is, I know where the footprint is, and then it's able to display it. Okay. All right. Now, for most of you, um, most of you who've dealt with databases before, it's like, yeah, I know all that. And for those who are new to databases, hopefully I've opened your eyes up. But what I'm going to kind of talk to you about today is where, where things get interesting. Okay. But let's talk about creating your library entry flow for a moment. Okay? Let's assume you already got your database up and running. All right. To be honest with you, creating a database is relatively easy in comparison to what I'm about to talk about. And if you actually do want to create a database for GRINs, at least through Altium, uh, if you can go on to YouTube and you will find uh, that I created a 23-minute video a couple years ago with another former Altium colleague of mine and it shows how you set up a database library in Altium. It's only 23 minutes long, and it's pretty simple to do and follow. And if you've got time, take a look at it. Just the search words would be Altium database uh, library, and you should be able to find it. Okay? However, there's an aspect that gets really tricky, and one that has not been addressed up until this point. Okay? If we look at the libraries, and I'll talk a little bit more of this in a moment. There's kind of a, a gap. It's not kind of. There is a gap, or I'll call it the wall. If I want to have a library system that everybody can look at and everybody can actually provide information into, that really doesn't exist up to this point. Because when we start dealing with that concept, we're now dealing with things like permission control. Who can just look? Who can make changes? Who's authorized to edit and delete? Right? those type of things. What about web accessibility? Is there a way for all of us to look at this database through some type of web application? Change history. Someone goes in there and they make a change to the database. I want to know who did it. Data input validators. If someone puts something in there, I want to make sure that the format follows along so that I don't have some of them as 1 fourth and some of them as 0.25. There's the overall maintenance of it, right? Um, you know, it, this idea of libraries by democracy, as they jokingly have called it in the past, this idea of everybody just throwing something into it and assuming that it's going to uh, build itself beautifully just by the mere fact that you put things into it, it doesn't work. Uh, the, the best analogy I can give you is I, anytime I go visit a company and I look in an electronics lab, I can always tell you if there's an electronics lab manager or not. Because electronics, an electronics lab that has a manager is always in pristine condition. And a lab that has everybody just doing whatever they want to do looks like it's a fire hazard. Right? We've all been there. And libraries will, will happen the same way. Databases will happen the same way if there's no maintenance to it. And then lastly, the ability to deploy improvements. Uh, that if there is some type of interface, who's going to handle all of that deployment to make sure that those improvements are being added in there? 
Okay. Well, when we look at it, the problem is, is that the gap exists between the EDA tools and the databases. So this is not just pinning any blame on specifically Altium. This is the whole EDA industry. That what the EDA industry is providing are library editors. Everybody can go in there and everybody can get in there and do whatever they need to do. Okay? And then there's databases. What are databases doing? Well, they're just storing. So then what about part entry? What are we supposed to do part entry here? We can go into the database and do things, but they allow everybody in to do whatever they want to do. We can do it in the EDA tools and they'll and anybody can do whatever they want to do. So up to this point, in order to create some type of methodology for everybody to put something in, it's had to be custom. Someone's had to go out there and do something custom. And what do we mean by custom? Well, maybe there's a flow, a document that says, look, when you do these things, uh, these are the emails that need to be sent back and forth to each other. And of course, that is just you know, ripe for opportunity for failure. And then there are people out there who are really good at doing scripts. And they've probably written a bunch of scripts that are necessary to allow this flow to come together. Okay? And that's really where a lot of people are struggling at this point. They've got great library systems, or they, they're trying to come together with great library systems, but it always comes about with this point of entry. So what are the costs? Okay? There's, there's a cost without having this gap filled. Well, the first one is just without a central library to begin with. Every time you don't have a central library and everybody's doing their own thing, you're risking a $10,000 spin every time. And you're almost guaranteeing a minimum of two weeks spin time, really more like four weeks depending on how severe it is. If you put down, let's say, a 900 pin FPGA and find out that it has a four month lead time, uh, you're going to be doing a tremendous amount of work in your schematic and you're going to be doing a lot of tearing out in your PCB to correct that. Okay? Now, what about the cost of, let's say, well, let's get a librarian and just work with what structures are there. We can work with a database library, give the librarian access, uh, Microsoft access, give the librarian um, you know, authority here, give them a salary. Okay? But now we're dealing with these queues and the dead time. And are the designers willing to have that dead time? Okay? And again, that dead, most designers, they have deadlines and they're not going to sit around with their th twirling their thumbs. It just doesn't work that way. And so there's a huge cleanup cost for rogue designers. So we don't necessarily see it in terms of an immediate cost, but we see it in terms of salaries and uh, delays in getting things done. Then lastly, well, the other option is to do scripts. Well, they're, they're expensive because a lot of times if you bring someone in-house and they're an engineer, and let's say they're getting an engineering salary, well, if it's taking them six months to do it, you know, up to a year, most of the time that's over $50,000, whether it's in salary and benefits. So, and then, of course, there has to be a continual maintenance of it. So all of a sudden, that engineer who's helping you out over there uh, is going to be responsible for this thing, and people are going to go to them and re request support, and maybe they have ideas, and there's process changes that they need to do to make those scripts work. Okay? So all of these things incur a really large cost. So this, it's kind of amazing. We've been able to operate with, with this pain point in here for so long uh, because one way or another, we're paying this cost over here, either through respins. Uh, or we're doing it by trying to solve the problem by putting a person on it either to run it or to somehow try to automate it. Okay. So is there a solution for this? And the answer is yes, a low-cost solution for it. And it is called ADLib. And this is a turnkey database library solution that answers all of these things for a very reasonable price. First and foremost, it's an effortless Effort, I mean, effortless DB lib deployment. You don't need somebody holding your hand for four days to get this thing installed. I was able to install it at about 45 minutes, and that's just because I was taking my sweet time putting it on my machine. Okay, now, it's based on a virtual. Um, it's based on a virtual machine, so you don't even have to worry about whether you're using Linux or you're using, um, you know, Microsoft one of the Microsoft servers. It works just great. Number two, permission management. It has it in there. You can set up different user roles. Parameter history tracking. Every time someone changes something, it gets tracked. You can define the categories, which are basically a nice way of saying tables, and the parameters for each one of those tables. Why do we need tables? Well, because you know what? You can have a resistor table, a capacitor table, you can have an IC table, so on and so forth, because different parameters are going to be applicable for different things. Uh, it's web browser accessible. So everybody accesses it through the web browser. There's no deploying, but there's something um, on everybody's machine. It's not uh, taking up any Altium Designer license because it's a separate tool altogether. And then the big thing over here is that it facilitates team collaboration. 
And I want to talk about that for a moment because that's really huge. I talked about initially this idea that you could take a, um, you could have either the Wild West where everybody builds their own parts, and then there's a librarian that just does the parts for everybody. Is there a nice way in the middle? And this actually facilitates this in the middle. So imagine this. A designer needs a part. They go out and they open up the schematic library. They, open, they create a new symbol. They save off that symbol, both its name and the file name by itself. They put it in a certain location in the network. They go into ADLib. They basically uh, go and create a new component. They point it to where the symbol is. All right? And then instantly after they're done with it, it's now available uh, from the database library. And then there can be someone later on, if there is someone who's going to be responsible for kind of maintaining these things, can add a footprint to it. Or the designer later on can add the footprint to it. Okay? And that, by doing that, you're basically allowing your designers to help you build a library, but in a systematic fashion, so it just doesn't become uh, an absolute disaster. Just to mention to you as well, um, in addition to ADLib, there is a tool called ADLib Plus, also from Solution Quadrant. This is the idea of if you need version control for any reason, then this will allow you to step up from ADLib to ADLib Plus. And by the way, if you save off all of your files in the way I just mentioned as separate symbols and separate footprints, not only does it not block off the library for other people to use, it actually lends itself to a version control system here rather nicely. One other thing I'll mention here is that they also provide a tool called Cadmium. And Cadmium, actually one of these has been deployed before. This is a large framework. Okay, it's a PLM framework. And the reason why we call it a fr framework is because there's a number of pre-made modules that build this thing up. Because normally when you're dealing with the PLM system, there is a level of customization. But there's also a lot of buy-in that has to happen on all levels. This is not just an engineering tool. This is made so that whether it's your finance folks, your purchasing folks, your engineering folks, uh, and anybody else in between who are dealing with components, you're getting them all to work together under one system over here. So it's a custom solution, though there are what I'll call plugins that, uh, that have already been designed. So as this is coming about and the methodology is being discussed with us, we can take some of those plugins and work with them, and other aspects will be custom code. Okay. So it's PLM components exposed through a database library uh, interface here. So the idea is that if you have your parts in your PLM, you can see them automatically in Altium Designer and any other one of your tools um, as well. There's a bomb upload automation here. And that's a big thing a lot of people are looking for is that, hey, I want my components to come from my PLM. But at the end, I want my bill of materials to go back into the PLM. Uh, revision management for all data design. Case okay, so is not just your component library. It's for everything. Uh, custom workflow management capabilities. We have to have discussions with the management about this. Again, that's why you have to have all the stakeholders in these conversations. And sophisticated change management options. Amazing the number of options they have for this. So if you are looking for something that's going to be kind of the grand unification, certainly consider uh, Cadmium to, um, to help assist in that. Okay, so that's why we're asking if you're interested in it, certainly let us know. So I'm going to push through this kind of very quickly over here. There's one real point that I want to bring up, is that if you start off with ADLib, you don't have to abandon it if you go to another, uh, into another solution, uh, especially ones that are provided from Cadmium here. Because even Cadmium itself is built off of the same database system that ADLib is built off of. Okay. And if you're interested in seeing these, by the way, as a side note, um, our slides are always available. You just simply need to ask us, and we're more than happy to send them to you. So if you want to spend a few minutes to take a look at this um, you know, on your own, just let us know. We'll be more happy to send you these slides. Okay. So let me jump on over to a quick product demonstration here. And I've got up, uh, I've got up 80 lips. And before I uh, do anything else, I just want to show it to you. So here's the web interface here. So it's just a matter of signing in. And once I go in here, it's actually a very, very uh, simple and straightforward uh, tool to use. I'm going to just jam through a part here very, very quickly, and then I'm going to slow it down a little bit. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to click into my resistor demo, which I am in right now, and I'm going to create a brand new component. All right? And this is very similar to what someone would do with this once they had um, purchased, the, uh, you know, purchased this and have it installed. So in here, I need to give it a new item ID, so I'm going to type this in. And I will uh, over. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to do this quickly. And then hopefully you kind of see where I'm going with this. Even though there's a lot of blank lines with it, 
um, you're going to see that uh, there's a lot of guidance here. So I'm not just putting anything I want. It's, allow, it's, it's allowing me to see what's been done in the past over here. Okay. Spelling's half the battle. Okay. Have this one, but I want to change this to a, I'm going to make a 30K for this. Okay, my package type here. So you'll notice it here, here's an example of a dropdown uh, with this specific lim, uh, stuff in it. The component type is resistor. Uh, my component kind is general. Okay, so again, everything that's been put in the past, you're seeing me fill it out here very quickly over here. Um, this is the footprint path. So I will put in 0603. Let me put it in this way here. I'm going to cheat a little bit over here, but it should find it. So you can see that even if I just type in a portion of it, it'll find it here very quickly here. My footprint prep will be 0603 here. This is the one I want to use. This is just a general name, 0603. So I have the ability to change these type of things if they become confusing, but relatively simple to do. I'm going to do this for the resistor. I'll drop this in, the resistor reference. I'll drop this in. I continue to type that along. And then I'll click on resistor general. My manufacturer's part number. I'll start typing this in, ZRJ. Even this one will probably come up here uh, very quickly. In this case here, I've got a uh, 30K ohm resistor. This is Panasonic. Even the data sheet, because it's all the same data sheet, the tolerance is 0 0.5. And even the ohms, um, I can put this in this way. And even though there may not be a 30 ohm resistor, a 30,000 ohm resistor in here, it gives me a feel for the format that's being used. All right, so I've just added this in. And now I've just created a component. And, and hopefully you kind of see how quick I was able to do this. But more importantly, now that I've added this in, if I go over here to Altium Designer, it's already available for me. So let me just jump over to miscellaneous devices for a minute, and I'll bring it back so I can refresh it. So let's go back over here to resistor demo. And there's my part. And I can place the part. So just by me putting that information in, it took me, what, about a minute. I'm glad. Thank you for bearing with me. But there it is. There's the part. OK. Now let me go through this a little bit slower, and then we'll open this up to some questions here. All right, let's bring up, bring this back on up over here. So <clears throat> I'm going to go back to the component library, and I'm also going to go back to the table that I've been working on here. So here are these various components that I have added in. If I want to review them, I can certainly do that. So let me go back to this one, which is the new one that I just put in. And um, I'll go into the edit mode here so we can make some changes here and you can see what's what. When I was typing this in, I noticed that I gave it a very specific unique ID. And that's why this was in red, because an item has to be, if anything is in red, it means it's mandatory. So I've got to give it something. And what I'm able to do is that though ADLib is not keeping a counter for me per se, just by me being able to search on it, I can tell what the last number was in this list. So just taking that last number and incrementing it by one I can make sure that my item ID is still going to be unique. Same thing you probably saw with the description over here. As I was typing these things in, whatever's been the prior history that's in there, it's going to show up. Okay? Again, as I said, spelling is half the battle here. So if I know that this is resistor 10K, for example, it's one of the ones I did in the past, I can easily grab that one and put it in there. Okay? The package type, you'll notice that there is an option here that if you have an enumerated list, you can do that. You can pick anything you want over here, and you can say, well, it's a through hole surface mount in this case. So I can prevent someone from typing in anything I want to do, and so on and so forth over here. And so by making these changes uh, to this, or by putting this in to begin with, you can see how easy it is for someone to add one of these things in. You can also clone it as well. So if all this information is going to remain the same, so for example, example for a resistor, it's easy enough to clone it because it just already fills in all the information. Certain things it can't do. But you know what? I can easily take this and call this part number seven now. And let's say I'm making this a 40K. Okay, all this other stuff's going to stay the same because of the footprint and so on and so forth. The only thing I got to change is the manufacturer's number and the value down here. I think I got them all. And then I just created just created another component and it will also show up in Altium Designer as well if I refresh this. Um, Again, I'm gonna, it's just a little easier for me to jump up and then jump back in, and you'll see it being refreshed. Okay? And there's the part.
So what else is in here, just very, very quickly, just to show you a few other features of it. How do you set up these tables and stuff? Very, very simple to do in library settings. You have your component categories. So every time you want to create a new table, just add a new category to it. Once you've added the table in here, it's just a matter of adding the parameters in. And whatever parameters you've created in the past um, now become available in this large list over here. If you want to create a parameter list to begin with, it's just a matter of going to the parameter definitions and adding them in and then also determining the type that they are. So for example, with the drill size, you would actually select the drill size, you set this up, and you just give it a list of things that you can select. You can see the same thing that I did for package type over here, whether it was an SMT, TH, or mechanical. All right, and there's a couple of other features in this as well. Also, under system settings here, just very quickly, this is where you uh, provide any updates. So if there's new updates from solution quadrants, this is where you plug them in. And then for the users as well, you can define very specific names. All right, and the reason why you want to be able to do this is that some people uh, need to have more access than others. So for a user, if they're set up as a user, it's read-only. For a librarian, it is to allow them to add, um, to add and to edit. And then for an administrator, uh, they have add and edit privileges along with adding people to this as well. That's really what it is. And that's the, the beauty of this thing here is that it's actually uh, very elegant, uh, very straightforward. It's very quick to navigate around. 